five or six years is really researching policing. Um, and also I've been an organizer and activist uh, throughout like the movement for Black Lives since Ferguson um, onward. And um, yeah, so I write, research, think, uh, organize about what it looks like to create safety and to shift away and dislodge policing and punishment out of how we understand that. Peace and greetings, y'all. Uh, again, I'm Dave Stovall. I'm at the University of Illinois at Chicago. For the last 30 years, I've been working with young folks and families around uh, quality education and then ending what people reference as the school prison nexus. And I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later today. Uh, the idea is that we have, we live in a world where we ask you all as young people to suffer through school without receiving little, without receiving education. And I think when we start to look at the way, we can begin to think about what are viable solutions. For. So for the last 20 years, I've been at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and I've been looking at this particular relationship between schooling and housing, because you can tell what a school looks like based on the housing that it's in proximity to. So when we start to look at those things, and it's not just zip code, it's literally what has been done historically to make sure that certain folks are kept out of particular communities. So that's been the majority of my work for the last 30 years with young folks and families. That's really great. And again, we're so excited to have you here. And I guess our first question would be, what do defunding the police and police abolition mean to you? And what is the difference? Um, and Professor Stovall, if you would like to go first, that would be wonderful. Okay, and I know uh, Brother McHarris has been doing this work really soundly and I wanted to shout him out. I caught you on Vice a couple of, about a week and a half ago, so wanted to thank you for that work. Um, when we talk about defunding the police, and I live in a city here in Chicago where 40% of the city's budget goes to the Chicago Police Department. So if you can think about a city where almost half of its budget goes to one entity, and now, if you think about where's the majority of that, where's that, that majority of that money go to, right? And also, I live in a city where the city of Chicago has paid almost half a billion dollars over the last 10 years in police settlements. So these are people who have won cases in court and some cases that didn't even go to court before the city settled and, and paid folks out. So we're talking about almost a billion dollars in 10 years, and then $1.3 billion every year going to issues that are concerned with police. So when we talk about defunding, you're literally talking about reconsidering that budget. So what does it mean to be in a space where almost 40% of your budget goes to one thing? So now if you considered defunding that space and saying, what could that be used for, right? So there's a group of young people here in Chicago called Asada's Daughters who actually did some data around this. And they said, well, look, the city of Chicago pays the Chicago Police Department $33.1 million a year. That's enough to pay for 300 plus counselors, 300 plus nurses, and about 200 athletic programs in the city. So if we think about that idea of defunding, we're also talking about reappropriation. When we talk about abolition, we're talking about the conditions that get us in the spaces that we are now. So now an abolition question is, why do we even have police? And what is their historical purpose? And then when we look at their historical purpose, how has, what have been the results of that? And now if we're talking about abolition, we're talking about eliminating the conditions that dehumanize us. And one of those conditions and one of those inst institutions that was structured to dehumanize black folks and folks of color have been police departments, right? In their manuals, right? You talk, you see things like the elimination of the threat. You see things like qualified immunity, right? So all of these practices and processes become important when we talk about abolition because abolition is the removal of these things that dehumanize us where defunding is actually talking about a reappropriation 
of the money that goes to those things that dehumanize us. That's great. And if Mr. McCarris, you would like to go next, that would be wonderful. Uh, you're muted. All right. Yeah, no, you know, um, yeah, lift up the, the things that um, Dr. Stovall just mentioned. And um, yeah, so I think like, just, you know, just in terms of context, like, I think a part of all of this, if we take a step back, is this idea that police equal public safety, right? That's an idea that is, is it undergirds all of this, right? It undergirds this whole the conversation, it undergirds. And the, the wild thing is that when you look at it, that idea hasn't existed for that long. That like, that it was, it was nationally accepted that the purpose of police is to provide and be this public, the stewards of public safety. You know, and so for most of history, police were seen as, you know, either illegitimate or like their, for their specific purpose of what they did. You know, the origins of, of modern policing in, in the US and the South began as slave patrols in the Carolinas. And that's not like, you know, like just making sense. It's literally like the, the origins of policing in the South are as slave patrols. And in the North, the, they developed as a way to bust union strikes and protect the capital of, of you know, of, of uh, capitalists, especially as like industrialization was going on. So there was more capital, there was more shipments happening. And the capitalists were able to convince, you know, the, the government to say, okay, this is actually in the public interest. Um, and also, you know, and so policing really became also as immigration was on the rise, in many ways, it became a tool to say like, okay, how do we control and maintain our order? But historically, the order is, you know, it's racial and class domination, and it's about the supremacy of certain groups. You know, when we think, when we think about white supremacy capitalism, it's about like certain groups being able to create, have a, have a sense of normalcy and, and um, order, but that order is structured around lines of, you know, inequality and exploitation. And so, but really when this begins to sort of shift is in the mid 1960s with Lyndon B. Johnson. And so this is like where, you know, I think it's, it's really important, like for you all. And like, as you're thinking about all of this is to think about, you know, the fact that like in many ways, liberals and like Democrats have been at the forefront of sort of pushing for expansions of policing. Um, we see that with Lyndon B. Johnson who passed the law enforcement assistance act. And that really propelled, you know, it became the first federal mechanism of, uh, you know, spending for policing. And in 1960, the U.S. spent $2 billion in policing. In 2018, it was $137 billion. So that is a large, you know, difference. And a lot of that, you know, in between that, when we look in the 90s, for example, Joe Biden pushed the crime bill, right? But when we think about it, it's like, well, you know, usually it's the Republicans that are, you know, kind of pushing stuff that is not good in terms of, you know, specifically around like black people and, and, and marginalized groups. But I think it's important to, to sit with, you know, the fact that it's, it's often been a push by liberals and, and, and by Democrats. And a part of that is also um, at all levels of government. So a part of it became Democrats wanted to say, you know, we are tough on crime too. You know, we're, we're not like soft. And there was, you know, there's some historical precedents, but basically, there was this political sort of incentive for Democrats to become tough on crime. And now all across the country, it's like if you're, you know, historically, if you were not talking about, you know, public safety being tough on crime, you were seen as like, you didn't care about public safety. And that dominated public conversation for decades. Um, so just to fast forward, so what does that look like? Defunding, it's a part of a broader process. Defunding became the framing for the demand, but it actually, it's, it, the, the framework is called Inves Dadas. So what that means is divesting from systems of punishment in this specific context, policing, and reinvesting that fun those funds into two things. One is community resources and institutions. When you look at it across the country, the safest communities don't have the most police, they have the most resources. We know that when you have quality schools, housing, mental health, health care, uh, you know, quality hospitals, quality neighborhood programs, that those are the things, and we, we've known that for decades, like those are the things that actually make safe communities, you know, but what, what people are given is, is police and prisons. But the other part of this is also developing alternative emergency response models. So it's, it's investing in community resources, but also alternatives, because 
the only way that you can guarantee that an encounter of police violence does not happen is to avoid the encounter altogether. It's the only way that you can guarantee it. All of the other attempts to say, well, let's implement this reform and let's try to, you know, let's give them more training. One, we've seen that the, the, that doesn't work. Minneapolis implemented all of them and didn't work. But also, it doesn't guarantee that those situations won't happen. And so that's why it's also someone is, you know, having a, a mental health emergency. Why is someone with a gun and the immunity to kill somebody showing up? Now, if you're if you have experience with police violence and a cop shows up and you're having a mental health crisis, that's likely not to go well. You know, traffic violations. Why am I being pulled over by a cop who can kill me with impunity because my taillight is out? It doesn't make sense. You know, we can go down the line, homelessness, domestic violence. 40 percent of police households experience domestic violence. So why is it that police are responding disproportionately to, to you know, cases of the cases of police of domestic violence when disproportionately they engage in, in, in domestic violence. And so how, like that logic of it's not sending the right people to the right things, but a part of this is a broader like upheaval of the entire system, which is the last piece I'll mention is around abolition is that the whole system, it's, 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 it's unreformable. Policing is not reformable. I think we, like if you begin there, then you start to see, you know, the, con the conversation between defunding and abolition. And so the goal then is to unearth the entire system. And even like for how we deal with violence and harm, it's, it's defunding and abolition is not about not having safety interventions. It's about having safety interventions that make sense and around having mechanisms of, of public safety that's not centered around punishment and control. So abolition is about unearthing it all and defunding in an abolitionist context is a, is a, is a step, it's a process that can be used for abolitionist aims. But there are people who are advocating defunding who are not abolitionists. So, but defunding really is about taking away resources and it can be used for different visions, but it's a tactic. I think those are both really valuable points and I really appreciate your input on this because I think it's really important to look at this in a broader context. Um, Caleb, would you like to do the next question? Yeah, sure. So, um, so we've, um, you, uh, Mr. McHarris, you've talked about this, uh, just touched on this uh, in your last bit, but proposed reform such as the banning of chokeholds and the escalation has been suggested by campaigns like Eight Can't Wait. And it's been, uh, it's received a lot, of, a lot of criticism from activists. So if you'd like to talk a little bit more about why reform isn't enough in the case of police, that would be uh, appreciated. Yeah, I actually co-wrote a piece with um, an activist, activist and organizer, Sherelle Brown. It's called, uh, It Can't Wait, it's based on faulty data science. It's, it's in a uh, medium, but, you know, basically those attempts, and just to, just to also flag, It Can't Wait, a part of because of the pushback, they, if you go to their website now, they have a claim where they took off the 72% reduction claim. Um, and they also have a, like in the front of it is around like, they have a header that says defunding and abolition. Um, and they, they issued an apology on the site that like sort of like contextualizes that, you know, the, what they put forth was in contrary to what organizers and activists were, were calling for. And it, it, it inter, intervened in a way that wasn't, you know, in the, in the spirit of actual transformation. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, like policing, it's not reformable. And, and when we think about a part of this is like when we focus on individual officers, right? We know that like this, the entire, first of all, th there's different kinds of police violence. I think what happens right now is that it becomes sensationalized, right? So these specific killings become the focus of attention. But for example, when someone is pulled over and they have to fear for their life, and it, it could be for, uh, you know, they, they didn't put their turn signal on, that's a, a form of structural violence, right? So that, you can't track that. You can't, you can't tr say, okay, how do we, stop police because that can't be tracked also when we look at like when police are arresting people for no reason if you've ever been arrested or like put in jail that's a violent process and we know that you know police criminalizing the criminal legal system criminalizes people based off of their race but it also based off uh you know um in terms of criminalization of survival and poverty and also you know the criminalization of sex work you know um we like if we think about the Stonewall riots, the ways in which you know um, sexuality and gender is is criminalized. So, really, the, a part of this is that the 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 violence of policing stretches so far that even an approach to say, okay, well, how do we stop it? it you it, it, because it's baked into the, the the design of it. And so, 
you know, again, the, the, the solution then, if, if the focus is actually on safety, because we have to take a second back, right? Police don't even do what, what is said that they do, right? When you look at the statistics, there was a recent study in, in New York Times where they looked at what are, what are 911 calls, what are police being dispatched to? Less than 2% in all of the places that they looked at were responding to anything even involving violence. Less than 5% of arrests in the country every year have anything to do with violence. And so even the, in the clearance rate for, for what police even clear, it's lower than like 40%. And so even what you know police are supposed to theoretically do is not actually what they're even doing. You know? And so, but even with regards to violence and harm, the ways that police respond to instances do not actually center safety and accountability and ending the harm. They respond you know, with like violence and force and that doesn't actually get at. So, you know, that's why people now are, are censoring perspectives like transformative justice and restorative justice, because what we see is that like the focus on punishment, control, vengeance, isolation, doesn't stop the underlining causes of, of what's giving way to, to, to harm and conflict. And so a part of this is also like, it's rethinking how we approach emergencies, but also how we deal with conflict and violence and harm, like more broadly. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Professor, do you have any more thoughts on uh, reform movements? Again, just to lift up Brother McHarris's point, you know, this idea, and this is going to sound uh, kind of crazy to some of you all, but maybe real, right? A good friend of mine always says, you can't put a bow on a putrid turd and expect it to be something else. Right. So it's, it's just that simple. Right. We can't you can't. It's still a putrid turd. Right. This idea of the form and function of policing has been around, has been centered in the death of black people. Right. I mean, from its formation to how it's adjudicated. And then when we even look at criminal legal systems. And I think this is important when we talk about that process of even being entered in jail. So here in Chicago, about 10 years ago, we actually had police stations, operating police stations in jail. I mean, I'm sorry, in schools, right? So if we think about these operating police stations in schools, then what is, it, what is thought about the young people who are in that space? And then to what extent could you engineer the response that you have to those young people who have an operating police station in their school, right? And I think there's another part that becomes important, and Brother McHarris mentioned that when we go into the criminal legal system, 80% of all cases that are entered in courts never make it to trial, right? That these are, these are decided by plea bargain. And then a lot of the plea bargain, in addition to you being disproportionately affected by way of race, these are also folks, again, where Brother McHarris mentioned crimes of survival are, or actually acts of survival are criminalized. And if you think about it, if you are arrested and then do not have bail money, then you're inside until your trial. So that means loss of job, inability to pay utilities. And now in that particular space, you have more folks who are in literally incarcerated for debt over any type of particular personal infraction. And I think when these, when these understandings get out to the broader public, then it shifts our conversation and it gets a broader understanding of why, on why something like abolition is possible and doable because there's some things that are standing right in front of our face that actually do not need to exist, right? And have only existed because of the idea of certain populations being thought of as best contained, marginalized, and isolated. Mm. Not bad. Right, I think the next question is coming from me, but uh, thank you guys so much for your insight so far. And now this is kind of more about the of tactics in the kind of process of advocating and pushing and fighting for 
a post-police violence, a post-police society, which is that in almost every kind of jurisdiction we have, we have incredible amounts of political power with uh, police unions, right? And uh, police control over systems of governance. So how do you guys envision that we overcome that kind of entrenched political power invested in the police force? I got it. Yeah. Uh-huh. I think um, one of the things, and thank you for that question, because this is a this is an issue, like here in Chicago, there's a critical point around the Fraternal Order of Police. So for folks who may not be familiar, the FOP is the police union, right? It's the Fraternal Order of Police that has these various jurisdictions in locales. And actually, those contracts with the FOP are some of the the deeper issues and concerns that we're finding out because this is where you get cases where this conversation around what I mentioned earlier, qualified immunity comes up, right? With this idea that police in their action of policing could be deemed immune to prosecution for these particular acts, right? So this is, this comes to anything from beatings to shootings to unlawful containments and Fraternal orders of police protect this. And I think this becomes important when we talk about shifting political power. It's going to take people to stand up against those FOP unions. It's going to take people to say, look, if you're going to be in this space, these things cannot happen. And I think the issue that people fear is the stalemate, right? So you you all may have heard of something referred to as a blue flu, right? And what the, all that means is that members of the police union are upset with the way that government is negotiating their particular contracts, and then they start to not show up for work. An abolitionist approach would say, great, we needed that in the first place. So now what is it that we're going to do, right? So I think it's important for us to think about, so as you all, as young folks study this and actually engage in political study, what does it mean to stand up to these folks who have it baked into their contract to literally abuse with impunity? And I'll give you all this one example, and some of you all have heard this story. In Chicago in 2014, there was a young man by the name of Laquan McDonald. Laquan McDonald had had a serious series of um, mental health episodes. He was in a school for folks who were differently abled. And one night he was on a bridge uh, walking and the reports came in that he was walking with an exposed knife. A cop drives up and there's a group of police already there who are surrounding him. A cop drives up and in his, with his dashboard camera, he thinks he turns his dashboard camera off, but he just turned the sound off. And he actually catches an officer, put 16 shots into this young man. His name was Jason Van Dyke, the cop who who did the shooting. When he was actually put on trial, the court made the decision that it was not wrong for him to shoot Laquan McDonald. The only infraction was he shot him too many times. And I think that's important to think about when we start to, we start to imagine what does it mean to fight against folks who say in their laws that it wasn't out of the ordinary to kill Laquan McDonald, who actually was unarmed. But you can't shoot him excessively. And I think when we stand up put to police unions, these are the things that we have to put in context because these are the type of laws that police unions fight for in their bargaining of contracts with the city. So I think it's going to take some wherewithal for folks on the grassroots and for folks who are currently in these policy policy making positions to stand up to that and say that there has to be something different. Because I think this becomes critically uh, important moving forward because those FOP contracts are serious and they're, they're the things that I don't see part of this 
broader conversation now. And I think when there's not part of that broader conversation, we have some serious problems because that's the baseline of the relationship between a police force and its municipality. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, you know, definitely echo, um, echo a lot of that. Um, yeah, I mean, like the, the fraternal orders of police, you know, in some places it might be like the benevolent associations and they have like, you know, specific names that actually it, it's confusing because sometimes like you might not even realize that it's a police union because of, you know, what exactly, um, you know, they, they call themselves or whatever. But I, you know, I think the main thing is that as, as um, Francisco mentioned, like it, there's, it's just a requirement that people start standing up to unions. And so really what that looks like is like, and I, you know, I think this is very specific to you all, um, you know, as like emerging leaders and, you know, potentially elected, elected officials. Um, a lot of what has happened, if we look at the previous decades, what has happened is, is that you know, police have been able to expand their funding, expand their power, expand their resources with little pushback, you know, because it was it was just seen as like, okay, well, yeah, this is what safety is. So yeah, keep increasing it, right? And to say something like, historically to say like, no, and some folks there, people like, you know, organizations like Critical Resistance, but over time, you know, if you were to push back against that, you were seen as like, you don't care about public safety, you want the city to go, to, you know, to just go into chaos and disarray. You know, and but what we see is like one is that when you look at the data, there's no correlation between reductions in what is referred to as crime and like the increase of police expenditure from two billion dollars to one hundred thirty seven billion. That there's no correlation. There's no like, all right, well this stop this, you know, and there's actual evidence like in New York in twenty fourteen to twenty fifteen, talking about like police unions, they were upset over um the mayor and you know, some some anti police violence activists. So they said, you know what, we're going to have a slowdown. We're going to stop showing up to work and we're going to stop all of the kinds of proactive policing, the beep walking, the uh, the low level summonses. We're going to stop doing this, you know, in, in protest. The wildest thing happened, you know, which is, I mean, not even wild, it's actually expected, but it's for many, it feels really wild. The reports of crime dropped. Like literally, like they just dropped. And so this this idea of public safety and police that it's become so tight that it that even feels wild to people because it's like wait you know police stop you know but just to just to hone in on the fact that that's not true so to just kind of dig into the question the reason a part of this is because police unions have been able to basically flourish without many people going against them because to go against them meant that you were against you know public safety and so what has happened is, is that from all sides of the political spectrum, what has happened is that it's created a political context and where people, you know, who are running for office in elected official positions have basically pandered to police unions and police for political support and for money. And what, you know, that has created is a context where it, it's, it's further empowered them. And so what that looks like is one way to think about this is to, how do you, in anything, how do you uh, outweigh you know, the influence of someone or the influence of an entity, you have to build and develop the political power and the people power to outweigh that influence. So if a majority of people in a city are saying, ah, we need to relocate this money and we need to stop, like, we need to make it easier to fire police and we need to do X, Y, and Z. And the elected official is running now, they have to favor with the, the, the people. You know, so the one way to think about it is that there just has to be enough political power and political will from potential elected officials and elected officials who are not afraid to stand up to police unions. That's the only way, you know, this specific aspect of it is going to work to say, you know what, I'm not going to take money from police unions. And actually, you know, we're going to, we're, I'm running on a platform to say we want to reimagine public safety. That's the platform that I'm running on. And like, we actually do want to divest. Saying that from, for saying that from jump, and that's where I'm at. And if the people are supporting me, now you've developed to shift the con the context of political power and political will and what is politically, basically like make it politically like unreasonable to not defund the police. That's a part of it. And a part of this is like having local and state and at all levels elected officials who are really shifting the conversation and who are running, begin to run on, like, you know, a part of my campaign, you know, is to say, 
we actually want to develop a system where police are no longer involved in traffic enforcement, which is actually happening. There's some push in New York or the police don't respond to mental health emergencies or homelessness or drug use. And we're going to develop different kinds of teams. And that's the platform. That's what I'm running on. That's a part of my, you know, my, my, my campaign so that when the people support it, it outweighs the, the power of the police unions. Cause what has happened is police unions have been able to flourish because there hasn't been any opposing and greater force to neutralize their influence. And so, you know, I think that's big. And also thinking about like decriminalization, when we say like, there's like the criminalization of poverty and survival, you know, it's not like abstract. It's actually like, you know, like it's really real and people are criminalized for, for literally surviving and, and, and also then also punished for surviving in different ways. And so what does it look like to say, like, you know, we're going to look at the, we're going to start looking at the criminal code and start decriminalizing, you know, like, as much as we can, we're gonna just like start pushing like, okay, sex work, you know, drug trade, drug, like we're, we're, we're just gonna start decriminalizing all of this, you know? And so I think that's like another aspect, police out of schools. I know you all have seen it. There's like this movement now that's been getting a lot of steam in a lot of places where police are being ejected from schools, right? And so that's like another, another, another way to look at it. And so uh, I would also check out Aid to Abolition and basically like take those, those are all things that can be implemented like now and think about what it looks like and then also a big part of this is schools like what does it look like to implement a transformative justice initiative or curriculum in your school what does it look like to have conflict intervention to have you know uh, uh, radical consent training what does it look like to have you know what is the escalation community-based de-escalation look like like what does it actually mean you know what does it mean to end patriarchal violence let's let's design a curriculum that challenges and, and 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 seeks to end patriarchy you know and so what does it look like also because that's where a lot of people learn how to be in the world at schools and so if we start to develop different ways of understanding being developing curriculums and approaches within schools that's also like a big part that can so then now when 20 years down the line there's a whole cohort of people who were not socialized into the idea that police and prisons are our only options for safety and accountability Thank you guys so much. And kind of as a follow up to that, what I wanted to ask is uh, kind of what do you see as the difference in efficacy between methods of trying to push for police defunding and a police abolition through uh, electoral politics, through getting people elected to do it, and versus kind of direct action as the method of choice for kind of seeking to implement a post-police society. And also this is gonna be our last uh, kind of moderator question. So for the audience, you guys should start thinking of questions you guys have and be ready to put those into the chat. So go ahead, uh, Mr. McHarrison, Professor Stobel. Yeah, um, the, you know, it's both. Like, you know, the, the, the momentum and the push and the organizing creates different kinds of conversations. And there have been, you know, there already have been some, some, you know, uh, elected officials who are like running and who are trying to shift, starting to shift the conversation is that, you know, a city leader can start to implement these things. Like, you know, they can literally just decide a city or county leader can say like, you know what, we're going to start, we're going to develop this new number. We're going to have this number called 727. And when people call for X, Y, and Z, we're going to have trained, you know, specialized teams to be able to respond to these specific situations to begin the process of actually developing a new way and reimagining public safety, you know, or we're going to have, like, we're going to have different people dispatched to different things. So I think elected officials have the influence and the power to begin implementing a lot of this. It just actually has to be in conversation with like people and like, you know, the people who are, who are really pushing this conversations, because what does it mean that like when a whole city is saying like, or like a majority of, of people in a city are saying like, hey, we want safety, this model is not working, and we want to reimagine it. And for the politician to say, no, I'm not listening to you, we're just going to keep it the way it is, right? Like, what, is that, what does that really mean? And then it, then it becomes a broader conversation around like, like a, a question of democracy. But I think it, it's both in it, you know, the two are in conversation with one another, and there needs to be a sustained push from, you know, um, from organizing activists and there also has to be elected officials who are willing to to 
you know, stand up and say, you know what, this doesn't work. And I think the Minneapolis City Council is a perfect example of this. Um, the folks who said like, we're hearing this, we're listening to this and you know, they're right. And it's not about just doing, and I think just to mention this too, like the focus on defunding and abolition, it's as much about creating and developing new things as it is as about, you know, dismantling and, 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 and divesting from something else. So people usually hear, all right, you're gonna defund and abolish, then we're not gonna be safe. We're, we're, we're gonna be like out here just like, you know, it's a free for all. But again, for every single situation, this is something that like I've started to say, like for every single situation, you know, one of the things that you could basically just start doing is go through anything that has to do with conflict, harm, violence, anything that makes someone feel unsafe and say, what is the kind of response in this specific situation that makes the most sense, that is trauma informed if it needs it, that provides people with the resources that they need, you know, and that centers a different kind of model for dealing with conflict and violence and harm. And let's start to build a blueprint to build something new. Um, and it, it can be a conversation, but it, it has to be, what we see at like levels of government right now, like another, just, just a quick thing is like, if a reform is trying to put more power or resources into policing or the prison system, it should always be rejected. That's just like having, it's just like a, it's like a sniff test. Like, does this, you know, increase power or resources? Is it more training? Even when we see like the, the bill that Democrats proposed recently, it, it seeks to give like hundreds of millions of more dollars to police. And I think those are the sorts of things that elected officials start to say like, okay, um, you know, we're gonna shift away from this. You know, we're not gonna listen to this. Cause right now you have a whole class of democratic leaders in Congress who are not listening to the demands of people who have been organizing and working around these issues for, for years, you know? And so, yeah. And just to, to double up on that, you know, and thinking about it, not as not those two spaces in terms of elected officials and grassroots organizing as mutually exclusive, exclusive, right? Because what we're talking about now is strategy and tactic, right? So now can we think about what would it mean for folks who are coming from these activist based protest based movement based work? into public uh, officialship, right? And, and this is where I think it becomes important. A lot of times the worry by people at the ground level is that once folks enter the political arena, they will be co-opted. And I think this becomes important in terms of how people understand their accountability to not only the people who got them there, but what they were actually in the streets doing and pushing people to think about and reconsider. And I think this becomes important. So now what we're really talking about is an internal accountability to the struggles that you may have come from. And I think this is a critically important piece when you look at those folks who are emerging from uh, grassroots efforts, right? There's an excellent uh, documentary on Vice TV called Black South Rising. And they actually talked about some of these contradictions because now when you're on the block organizing folks and bringing attention to the issue and concern, now once you become elected, your responsibility is no longer to the people who got you there, but now to these issues and concerns of the city. Right, and they don't have to be mutually exclusive, right? Just like Brother, Brother McHarris said, if you came up for campaign and said, "Look, I'm for the I'm for the support of community safety. Community safety does not have to come in the form of policing. It can actually be in these particular ways." And those things, I would argue, to be the shifts in how we understand the work. In Chicago, we have an aldermanic system, so we have 50 geographic wards that's represented by a person. Uh, my older person is a woman named Jeanette Taylor. And Jeanette Taylor comes from grassroots organizing with parents, families, and young people. When she was elected, I love what she said in her victory speech. My duty and responsibility is not to the capitalist regime of the city of Chicago. My duty and responsibility is to the people who got me here 
and to make sure that their issues and concerns are prioritized. So and that's a very different approach, but I think you all as folks who are being trained to understand this really have to think about not just the constituency and trying to move a constituency, but what is your responsibility to the folks that you say you come from? How do you make sure that you are doing what you say you are going to do according to what you promised supposedly in a campaign if that's the route that you took? So I think this idea of really understanding accountability and not to think of those spaces as necessarily mutually exclusive, but if you enter the political realm and electoral politics now, what is the responsibility? Because the, what the system will say is that your first responsibility is to the party. And that's problematic. Your responsibility should always be to the people, right? And now how do you manifest that particular understanding to is your commitment to the people? Jeffrey, you're muted. <laughs> All right, um, everyone, we're now going to enter our um, audience question portion of this. Hi, I'm Jeffrey. I'm the co-vice chair along with Deirdre. Um, the first question is, and I guess uh, either one of you can like tackle this question first if you want. Doesn't like uh, matter. But um, your question, the first question is, how can one convince? convince the general public to go along with a seemingly radical idea such as defunding and or abolishing the police? And yeah. Something super quick. You, I, I think this thing around proselytizing to people and trying to get converts is the problem, right? I think the idea is really the framing, right? So when you say, look, here's what public dollars have been used to do in the form of policing. Here's what this is amounted to. Here's what's been happening. What we're putting forward is th if we use X public dollars in these spaces, here's the results that we will get. And we can take, we can actually get, learn lessons from places that have actually done it. I think the idea of people framing radical proposals is this idea that it's been done, it's, it's been done in places and has worked. The question becomes to what extent are we willing to say more of the same will work, right? I mean, I think that, that's, a, that's a, a very explicit understanding. And I'll pull a, a play with me being from Chicago. I used to watch Obama do this. Obama used to go to community meetings. And this, this, is, before he was, this is before he ran for Senate. This is when he was still doing state rep stuff. He would go to, he would go to meetings and he, once, he be, once he got to the level of Senate, he stopped doing this. But when he was at the local level, he would say to folks, look, you want an elected official to represent your issues and concerns. If you do not feel I will represent your issues and concerns, there is no good reason for you to vote for me. And the person who's next to me is probably your best candidate, right? But once stakes got higher, buddy stopped doing that. Right? <laughs> and the issue and concern was, okay, man, look, we, we know what it is and we've seen you do it. Now we're holding you to account. And I think this becomes a critically important moment because don't think about it as converting people, right? The data is the data. The data is on our side when we look at something like policing and we know clearly that it has not worked. And we got examples of spaces where it has worked in more conservative countries. Well, folks who are interested in looking at this, I would always encourage folks to look at Portugal. Portugal is an extremely conservative space and pretty much a theocracy in terms of it being predominantly Catholic. Portugal did something that changed their entire criminal legal system. They decriminalized drugs. And what resulted in that decriminalization was arrests decreased by almost 50% and people entering treatment almost increased by 80%. So this thing around thinking about this in particular ways is not so much that it's this radical proposal that's going to put us all in purgatory, but literally saying we have examples and we must be clear 
that the thing that we currently have is not working, right? And I think all the data that uh, Brother McHarris put forward, some of the stuff that I put forward is, is reflective of that. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I'll echo that and just like quickly say that um, it, yeah, the question is, it's, it's, it's right in the sense that like people's whole life, they were told that police make people community safe. It, it makes, police are the created the public safety. So when you say something counters to that, it's almost like telling like a young person that like who believes in Santa Claus that Santa Claus doesn't exist. Because like, it's like you have this idea and it's the power of socialization that like, and it's not only just you're, you're in schools, teachers tell you in different ways, um, you know, on TV, you know, you see messages, the law and order. It's basically like from every different angle, you, you sort of start to internalize this idea you know, that like, no, police, you know, make people safe, police make people safe. So I think a part of that is one, like, study it, you know, just study all of this. And then, you know, see if there are certain people who have made like certain, like, basically, a part of this is making like the what sounds really radical common sense. And that's both like, you know, one way to do that is like, look at people who have done that. And so it's some of the feedback that I've gotten on some of my interviews, like um, the CNN interview that I recently did. And there's a recent, um, on HBO, I have like a segment. Uh, this is not me self promoting. I'm just saying because people have told me like it's it it has been useful. Um, but on HBO, there's like a segment where they also included like animations. It's season three, episode nine of HBO and Axios. Uh, but basically, like animation, this like basically using different tools and strategies to show people like oh okay, policing doesn't work. It, it it actively harms certain communities, but it also doesn't work in the way that like we think it works. You know, and it actually is getting in the way of public safety. The main thing that I would say rhetorically is that you have to just emphasize that it's not about just dismantling something and leaving people like abandoned. It's about creating, the real focus is around creating and developing alternatives that actually make people safe and that will make, you know, more broadly us all safer. You know, and I think that's like the, both like to stop the harm and violence against black people and marginalized people, but also because this model does not work in the way that, you know, it, it, people conceive of it. Because most people don't report things that they experience anyway. You know, and so even the model of, you know, policing to solve and prisons to solve the issues, it doesn't, it just doesn't work. You know, we know that like for if we go across like two thirds of survivors of, of sexual violence don't report it to the police. You know, and we can go down the line of all of the things that people do not report, but the model is actually getting in the way by sending police as like, you know, as the, the, the stewards of public safety. So I think, you know, the, the main thing is just like study it because if people will try to get you in gotcha moments, like, oh, how about this? And then you're sitting there like, well, well, how about this? It's like for everything, there can be an alternative. You just have to like study and imagine it. And really like, so when you get those questions, it's like, oh, so people get to the point where it's like, if I keep putting this forth, I basically have to get to a point where like, it, it's like, you have to make people realize how irrational it sounds if they're advocating for the police. Yeah, um, yeah, guys, I, uh, yeah, we have like, I don't know, like six, six or seven minutes left. So I just like wanted to, uh, Tilly Robinson asked the question, do any of you have a strategy for ending presence of SROs in local schools? We've actually, we've actually seen this in uh, Minneapolis that we referred to in a couple of instances where folks literally put it on the table to remove SROs from schools. Here in Chicago, we just lost a vote four to three uh, to uh, keep SROs in schools. But I, one of the things that people put forward that I thought was very powerful was this idea of that we, there was a report in Chicago that came out about sexual harassment in schools. The majority of the sexual harassment cases reported by young people in schools came by way of the SRO and teachers, right? So this thing around rethinking what is happening in the space and really asking the questions of what utility is this for young folks in having a viable learning environment. And one thing real quick, a lot of times when people ask the question, I think it's a, I think it's a false narrative to ask people the question, do police make you feel safe when we're talking about schools? I think an important question to ask folks is 
what makes you feel safe and what engenders a sense of belonging in a school, right? That's a very different question. And I think the answers there will pull folks further away from SROs because it's not about them actually enacting any form of safety, but more marginalization and containment. But this idea of when you ask young folks, if we trust you all to give us the answers that we know we need, but may not like as adults, I think that's when we start to shift what we actually do in schools and then pushing us toward the removal of SROs or school resource officers for folks who may be unfamiliar with the term. Yeah, no, yeah, just echoing all of that. Um, uh, yeah, I think some of it to like, you know, some ways to like, just to like, if I were to ask you all develop a plan to, to have a safe school that doesn't, you know, like what, what are safety interventions? And if you come together, parents, communities, teachers to say, okay, if we wanted to create a safe environment and a safe learning environment, and it's a safe space for students to learn, how do we design a model that can, you know, manage and mitigate potential things that might make people unsafe and you know really prioritize like safety and care let's 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 make a blueprint for it what would this look like you know i think like in looking to the case of minneapolis would be a, a really good um like you know model because they decided that you know they're gonna uh you know shift away from policing and i would just i would look at a uh it's a, there's an article in prison the the news outlet by tamar sarai davis um, the title is that makes you feel like you're being criminalized. Students call for an end to in school police. And it sort of discusses a lot of this. Um, and just to like, you know, a lot of the, there's been a lot of momentum. There's been a couple campaigns who have won to, to remove police from schools. And, um, you know, I would just keep track of this and like start to develop like strategies and, and, and ideas around, okay, how did they do it here? What is working? What's not working? Um, and then really the, the the big thing with all of this is that people will say, okay, well, if you get them out, then what's the safety plan? What's the safety intervention? And I think that also like starting to think about, okay, what would this look like to have a safe school? For example, my high school that I went to in Newark, New Jersey, we didn't have police, but we had like a system in order to, to you know, foster a sense of safety, you know, like, and so what does it look like to sort of take from what works, figuring out different ways to really prioritize safety that this lodge is policing, right? And so I think that is like the core of it. It's like research, study, look what works, and then also just start asking yourself, like, what are the different things that can happen in school? And how, how can I think about like, how, how can we, like how can my fellow students, how can like people, you know, that I'm in community with start developing and thinking about, like if someone were to come to you and say, what would it look like to have a safe school? Like start writing, like write it down, like start writing down, okay, well, when people, might do this, this is what can happen, and this might what happen. And because a part of this is also like people are the people who are directly impacted by things know often know the best ways that that you know they can intervene and and, and you know prioritize safety and can also like learn and figure out and and and, and really deeply study. And so um, yeah, and a plan that is that is somewhere might look slightly different than a plan somewhere else around what like building a safe school might look like. And so that's why I think a lot of this the nitty gritty of it comes down to like people who are being, who are experiencing this saying like, actually we know, like we know what might keep us safe and we can also learn and study and figure it out. I think that will do it for our audience Q&A and I would just like to extend my uh, furthest thanks and a uh, really deep appreciation for um, Philip McHarris and Professor David Stovall for um, taking the time to be here and discuss police abolition, what defunding the police looks like in everyday life. And I encourage you all to practice abolition in your everyday lives, um, because I think this is a really good um, issue that we need to act on. And I would just like to thank everyone for being here. Um, I think this was a great discussion and um, that will do it for today. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you all so much for having us. Truly appreciate it. Thank you guys. Oh, bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming.